Uh, my name's John Humphreys. I'm going to be chairing the uh, tax reform panel we have, but I'm also going to give my own little rant first. So I might uh, jump straight into that in the interest of time. Um, I had a quick look at what the others are going to say, and it seems appropriate, although uh, they're, they're all a bit moderate, <laughs> as you get sometimes. So uh, as it turns out, uh, I think I'll be both the most uh, radical in one comment, uh, but then I'm also going to be the most moderate by far. I'm going to make the uh, libertarian case for a progressive income tax, which I'm not sure if anyone's tried to make the libertarian case for a progressive income tax before, but you let me know whether I succeed in convincing anyone. Um, the radical part first, uh, we shouldn't have tax. Um, and then we'll, everyone will debate and discuss the way we should uh, rearrange the deck chairs. Uh, but I, if, if we are going to be naive enough to think that uh, government should run society, uh, then I think we can still fund it without tax. But right, having said that, we'll jump into the actual realistic part of the talk. Assuming we are going to have tax, and further, assuming that we're going to have income tax. There are two theories about how public finances get done. There's the kumbaya theory, which is that sensible politicians work out what programs they need, what programs are going to value add. That's not me, don't look at that. Um, and then after they look at what programs they need, what's going to improve the world, then they find the most efficient way of raising tax so they can pay for those programs. So that's a kumbaya theory of how public finance works. That's how most people pretend it works. Uh, the other theory is called reality. Uh, in reality, what happens is basically the government raises as much money as they can, and then once they've got it, they spend it in whichever ways maximizes their vote. So the important part of that, the reality part, is they raise as much money as they can. Now, what is that? That's not 100% income tax. So I'm going to touch on the concept of a Laffer curve here, and I don't think I need to explain it to most people especially anyone who came along to the talks by Art Laffer. Was that, when was that? A year ago? Anyway, some wonderful talks by Art Laffer <laughs> brought by the IPA, I believe, down in Melbourne. Uh, it, the La Art Laffer is the person that the Laffer curve is named after, funnily enough, after he wrote the concept on a napkin, I think over lunch with Donald Rumsfeld. Uh, I think there was more than one person at the lunch. Yes, we can go. I, what did they order, Taylor? Um, <laughs> the concept of the Laffer curve is uh, as you raise the tax rate from 10 to 20 percent, you, you get more revenue. If you keep raising the tax rate, eventually you hit the point where you've raised the tax rate so high, you've created so much disincentive that people either stop working or stop reporting their income, importantly, and the tax base shrinks so much that eventually if you keep increasing the rate, you start getting less revenue. Right, so if you increase the rate from 90% to 100%, theoretically then you'll probably get nothing, because why would anyone report any income if it's a 100% income tax rate? So the, what we'll call the Laffer maximum is the point somewhere in the middle where the government would raise the maximum amount of revenue. So what would be the income tax rate that would raise the maximum amount of revenue? I should quickly note that the income tax rate that raises the maximum revenue isn't really what we should be trying to achieve. Uh, I, I'm suggesting we look at this based on the realistic theory of government when I said before the government's going to try and raise as much as they can. So let's consider what that could be. Um, it's fairly easy to actually work this out now thanks to uh, <coughs> Martin Feldstein's great work on the elasticity of taxable income in the late 90s. I won't bore you too much with the maths or the economics of it. The long and the short of it is though uh, we can work out what order of magnitude what it's likely to be in Australia. Based on middle of the road assumptions, the Laffer maximum in Australia is probably around 45%, or the short term Laffer maximum is probably around 45%, which is to say if your top marginal tax rate is above that, then we're probably losing money by having that top marginal tax rate. So a few things to note there. Uh, one is I should quickly say that the long run Laffer maximum is likely to be a hell of a lot lower. So in the long run, the Laffer maximum might be 20%, 30%, something like that. Uh, but 
Most politicians are going to be thinking short run, and most people who report on the Laffer curve think short run. So let's stick with that, 45%. An obvious thing to note there as well is Australia's top marginal tax rate is currently 49%, which doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense. The government said they needed to raise more money to help uh, fix the budget deficit, so they raised the top marginal rate from 47 to 49 uh, if my calculations are right that the Laffer maximum is about 45%, their increase in tax, the, the extra 2% slug on the rich, will raise approximately zero dollars. Perhaps negative a few million. So let's be realistic, that was just about the government proving that they hate rich people too, so they could like, get in touch with the common man. It wasn't about raising revenue because it didn't raise revenue. Um, no. Now, there's an anecdote on this as well. From the UK, the UK recently, recently, a few years ago, raised the top marginal tax rate from 40% to 50%. They thought they'd raise seven billion pounds. Uh, it turns out they raised zero. Again, another example of the, uh, the Laffer curve in action. And they worked out that in the UK, the Laffer maximum is probably about 47%. So the same ballpark we have in Australia. Now, the reason I'm ranting about that is that, that ties in the idea that I said at the start of this, which is the libertarian case for a progressive income tax. Now the way we worked out 45% relies on two statistics. One is the elasticity of taxable income. Don't worry, it's a number. The other one is a, a, a measure of the tax structure, which is influenced by where the tax thresholds are. And that number becomes irrelevant when they're is no tax threshold. The meaning of that is, the consequence of that is, if you have a flat tax, you have a much higher Laffer maximum. That's the point of this, so I'm going to repeat it. If you have a flat tax, you have a higher Laffer maximum, which means the government can raise a higher, can raise taxes to a higher level and continue getting in more revenue. And if you take the realistic view of public finance that the government is going to tax as much as they can, if you have a flat tax, they're going to be able to tax more. Indeed, the Laffer maximum uh, for Australia, using the same assumptions that I did to calculate the 45%, if we had a flat tax, the Laffer maximum would be 63%. So taking the realistic approach that the government will raise as much as they can with a flat tax, we'll have a flat tax of 63%. With a progressive tax, we'll have a top rate of somewhere around 45%, and obviously below that for people that aren't on the top rate. So that's the libertarian case for a progressive income tax, that if we are realistic about the way the government works, I think we'll be able to actually keep the tax rates lower by having a progressive income tax, because it lowers the Laffer maximum. So that's the spiel. You can tell me later whether you think uh, that made sense, convinced anyone, or whether I'm just crazy. Um, all possible, maybe at the same time. Uh, so that's the end of my spiel. So I'm going to now pass over to the people who are going to make, uh, I guess, much more sensible and moderate discussions about <laughs> tax reform. So I think, uh, who are we going to start with? Andrew. I'm not going to do much of an introduction. I'm just going to let everyone get up and uh, get straight into their talks. So everyone, please welcome Andrew Bragg. Good morning. That's uh, the best type of introduction. Uh, so... This morning, I wanted to talk to you about uh, the perspective of, from the business community on, on tax reform. I think people would agree that if you think about last calendar year, when we were going through a, a tax white paper process, that the business community was pretty poor in engaging in that, um, pretty, unimagin pretty unimaginative and, and extremely moderate, um, to borrow from your playbook there. So look, uh, what I want to do is quickly cover off on, we have a clicker? No, I can use this thing, right, fine. Is, um, so I want to give you um, our perspective. We represent um, 130 financial services companies and basically I'll give you a view on uh, our perspective on company and business tax, um, what type of tax mix switch we could have uh, and why, why that, that's important. The, Overarching all this uh, is our lens that uh, competitiveness, how competitive our economy is, 
uh, is one of the things that's been missing from the public debate. So we very much look at this through the lens of how competitive are we uh, in an era where capital is mobile. So to rehash a lot of the, the well-known points, uh, the tax system as it stands today is very reliant uh, on companies and, and persons. Um, and as you can see over the next 30 to 40 years, uh, demographic trends don't look too, too flashy if that's where, that's where you're relying. Um, e extraordinary costs um, of that approach and, and, and big, big risks of the, the way that we're taxing. Um, we're quite unique in the way that we, we do tax comparing to the OECD. I'm not saying we want to, we want to uh, replicate the OECD, uh, but we have quite a novel approach here as that spider shows. Um, again, the argument that uh, we're a low tax country has got um, a lot of flies on it. Uh, the analysis here that has been done, and I'm sure discussed widely over the last day and a half here, uh, is there again for you to see. And so that's, that's really the, the why. I want to dig into company tax here. So um, compared to our other uh, com competitors, you can see there that um, we're really one of the only countries which has had no proposal to lower the overall uh, rate. You can see there the Canadians have um, brought theirs down. If you can't see the back, uh, Canada's in orange. Uh, now we compete with them for uh, especially mining investment. Uh, so that's a, that's a problem. Uh, secondly, we're, we're incredibly reliant on company taxes as a percentage of GDP, but also in terms of uh, total tax <coughs> revenue. So we're around double of the OECD average uh, reliance. Um, almost 20% of Commonwealth revenues come from uh, company tax, so we're very reliant on that tax. Uh, against uh, Asian economies, of course, uh, very uncompetitive there. Uh, and I want to stop on that point. So uh, I, I think that the central point with, with company tax is uh, when you're already very reliant upon that um, and, and capital is mobile and you're trying to, uh, to attract new investment, uh, especially in uh, the services economy where capital is very, very nimble and it will go to the best business environment, um, then you've got a real problem. So uh, the industry that I represent, financial services, uh, you've probably heard this buzzword fintech. It's basically just um, you know, um, investment going into areas where there's technological advances and it will just go to the best business environment, right? And now, we've, we've actually got a lot, a lot going for us here because this is a great country to, to live, but people uh, are not inclined to make the investments here. Uh, they, will, they will do so in, in Singapore and Hong Kong and increasingly now uh, into New Zealand as they, as they begin to reduce their, their company tax. Uh, I want to touch on the, this life insurance business. Um, now, uh, most of you will have the, had the pleasure of never having to think about life insurance uh, and I'm very happy for you all. Uh, it's very exciting. Uh, but, but I just wanted to give you this quick case study on how it's taxed. So um, you can see here this beautiful infographic shows you that it's the, um, it's the second least efficient tax we have. So there you go, it's worse than, it's only worse than, what's the worst one? Motor vehicle tax, yeah, very good. And then um, this is one of my favourite stats. So, sorry, 22% of the revenue raised from insurance duties disappears in the cost of collection. Amazing. So what a great tax that, that is. Basically, in the 20, this, this is very relevant to Louise as a Victorian MP, but for the 2014-15 uh, state budget beforehand, the, um, the government announced then that they were abolishing stamp duty on life insurance. And as you can see, they, they did such a good job of abolishing it that it actually um, went up, uh, the revenue collection has gone up there. So that's good. Um, <laughs> very good. And um, this is- That's the laugh And this is, and this is my other, this is my favourite slide. So this is the abolition of state of stamp duty in Victoria um, in 2014. You can see as it went up. At the same time, the ACT actually um, announced that they, they would be abolishing stamp duties, and they have done that. And you can see that it actually does go down. So that's good. Um, now, my point there is really that uh, the, the boondoggle of um, state taxes is, a, is, is an enormous problem because you can have a, a government put out a press release saying we're going to abolish stamp duty on life insurance, which technically is true, but you've mo moved the duty onto uh, what they call uh, total and permanent disablement cover, which um, every working Australian which, who has super, which is everyone, uh, has to have uh, life insurance as part of that package. Uh, so when you get life insurance, you get life and TPD. 
so if I move, if I abolish the tax on life, put it onto TBD, it has the same effect. Same, same effect. So that's why, that's why that, um, that's why the tax, although it's been abolished, has actually gone up. So uh, now, basically, insurance is, is one of those industries which is pretty dynamic. Uh, capital is very mobile uh, in that area. In that area, and uh, trying to explain that to um, prospective investors and uh, companies that have um, a presence beyond just Australia is um, is very difficult. Very difficult. Uh, I'm trying to make make light of this, and that's not working either. But it's uh, I think that's a pretty good example of of why a business should be wanting tax reform. Personal income tax, as you know, very high. And I wanted to finish on this bit here, uh, which is I know controversial here, but. But we, we put forward what we call tax mix switch. Uh, basically, that's what it is, 22% um, company tax rate, um, a, uh, a flatter indexed uh, personal income tax scale, uh, uh, removal of those uh, insurance duties, of course, uh, and funded by a bigger GST. Now, basically, we got KPMG to, to model this. Um, at the same time, the Treasury was modelling the, uh, the package for the, the, the current government. And, and you can see there that the the one on the left there shows that uh, that tax mix, which would, would give you a, a bigger economy, obviously 2% bigger economy. Um, the, the, the big spike in that comes from uh, investment, which uh, is boosted by almost 4%. Now, most of that's foreign capital coming in here, so that's not, not particularly surprising. Um, the budget impact is interesting. The budget impact, especially on cutting company tax, because that's been a big feature for the last week or so. Uh, you can see there that it's only it's only a twenty billion dollar um, uh, re reduction overall. That that's a revenue neutral package um, because business groups obviously feel that they must put forward packages which don't really play too too much with um, with expenditure. That's some, one of the constraints. Of course, we have to to uh, endure. Uh, but in 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 in, e in essence, the government's uh, package to cut company tax from, from the budget to twenty five, not twenty two, and obviously by twenty. Uh, 2024, 2025, um, basically gives you uh, a increase in a growth of about three quarters of a percent. So you can see there's a big difference there. So I guess the big question is when we get to uh, 2025, whether we're going to have 20, 25 percent going to cut it. Our view would be that we really need to get to 20 percent um, in this decade. So I think we're a long way behind there. So wrapping that, that all up. I must say to you that it's very, very difficult getting business groups to put forward um, uh, policy ideas in the area of tax. Um, it is very controversial and many executives and many businesses are afraid to put their toe in, their toe in the water, uh, especially when that comes with um, a discussion on, on expenditure. Uh, that's the first point. The second point is the package that we've put, we've put forward was one of only two fully costed packages that any big business group put to the tax review last year, BCA put another one. So um, you know you may not agree with what we focused on there, in, and I know the GST is especially controversial, but it is at least a package. Uh, and I encourage people that have business links to talk to your business councils, talk to your business uh, reps, um, and get them to, to to do some more thinking. Because the examples I've given today about, uh, especially on the insurance one, which I know is rather dry. Um, kind of not funny, maybe funny, kind of, uh, is, is, is it's a good, good example. I mean, it's obviously, it's a boondoggle. I mean, good luck explaining that to someone who is not, is not from Australia. So thanks very much. So I said I wouldn't do intros and I won't do really a proper introduction. I just want to mention that uh, everyone's quite aware of the, the recent success of, uh, of Jimmy P, of, of James Patterson from the IPA getting into the Senate and Tim Wilson's just around the corner to get his safe seat, so that's another from the, uh, the IPA that'll be going into Parliament. Um, I just uh, also think we should uh, notice the, someone who's already been there, someone who's done it before them. Uh, Louise Staley was at the IPA at some stage, I believe, yeah. uh, and is already in the uh, Victorian Parliament and has been for a couple of years now, is it? Yeah. So everyone, please welcome Louise Staley. I see Senator Day in the audience, uh, fellow panellists, ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much for coming along to tax reform uh, on a Sunday morning. I uh, had a conversation with Fiona Patton last week in the parliament and she said, oh, we're both speaking at the same conference. I said, what are you speaking on? She said, sex and drugs and rock and roll. She came back, what are you speaking on? Tax. <laughs> uh, so, uh, 
You know, I really do appreciate that you chose to come to tax. I did work for the IPA for quite a while and I specialised in uh, work on rural and regional regulation and also property rights. Uh, and uh, in 2014, I was elected to the Victorian Parliament in the country seat of Ripon. And I uh, currently hold the, uh, the accolade or, or achievement of being the last Liberal elected to a parliament uh, in, in Victoria winning a seat off Labor. We haven't won any since then. So um, I hold a marginal seat for those of you who think that the only way a classical Liberal or a libertarian can get into the parliament. That's not true. I, I hold a marginal seat. So I wanted to talk today about uh, tax reform within the current total tax take. So the argument for cutting taxes is, of course, an important <coughs> one, and one that we are coming from where we come from on the, the ideological philosophical, philosophical spectrum team to talk about. But I think there is an a equally important uh, conversation to be had uh, about cutting, about changing the tax mix. Because if we only talk about cutting taxes and we cannot uh, get through the expenditure cuts that are required to, to offset that, all we are doing is advocating for uh, increased budget deficits. So uh, to just give you a bit of a flavour about what I'm going to touch on, I'm going to talk about federalism, vertical fiscal imbalance, uh, horizontal equalisation, and uh, I can see I've really got the crowd. Uh, and uh, I'm going to finish with, in case I haven't uh, put you to sleep, I'll wake you up with a conversation about land tax. So um, when we think about how we should have taxes raised and how our governments should work, and, and we have a federal system, and as classical liberals, libertarians, liberals, I prefer Tim's uh, nomenclature, and I'll call myself a liberal from now on in. Um, we think it's important that you have devolved government and that people are you know, making the decisions closest to uh, the people that they affect. Under our current taxation system, we certainly do not have this. And uh, as a result, we have things like enormous federal bureaucracies in health and education, despite the fact that you know, federal government does not run hospitals and uh, it certainly doesn't run schools. And the, there are other federal, federal systems that manage this better than us, and Canada uh, is, is an example. But one of the results of that is that the quality of state government suffers, and it's, everybody thinks the main game is in Canberra. If you end up in the state parliament, well then, you know, you're clearly second rate. You couldn't make it in the main game. Why would you want to be there? And look around you, they're full of hopeless people anyway. And, you know, the quality of the parliamentary uh, Liberal Party in both New South Wales uh, and uh, Victoria, look at them, look at them. And I won't even go to those in other states. Um, and one of the the result, reasons for that is that, that young people coming through get this message, they want to go federal. If they can't go federal, they don't go into politics at all. And so it does become more self-fulfilling, yet the states are responsible for really important areas of policy, and I've mentioned two, education and uh, schooling, and we should have really, really clever people there coming up with really interesting and new ideas in the parliaments. So I say to all of you who are thinking about a potential political career, think state. Uh, the other thing I'd say is that the way we do our federalism is that the, we have COAG, the, the Council of Australian Governments, and it creates national rules for all sorts of things that it shouldn't do. So it creates them for wind farms and it creates them for how you can have a childcare centre and all these things. And then the state government, the people that have been at those meetings go back to their state parliaments and put legislation through the parliament that is just a rubber stamp of what COAG has agreed. Now, again, it leads to um, you know, a dumbing down of state parliaments. And it also leads to increasing problems with vertical fiscal imbalance. Now, is there anybody who doesn't know what vertical fiscal imbalance is? Yep, good. 
So, what it is, is the federal government raises most of the taxes and the state, government is, state governments are responsible for large areas of expenditure that they do not raise taxes for and therefore the federal government transfers funds to the state governments. And um, in 2014-15, that was $101 billion was transferred from the federal government to the states, 24% uh, of Commonwealth revenue. Now, of that $101 billion, tied grants make up $46 billion of the total grants, and they're mainly for um, health and education. So this is where the federal government is funding schools, hospitals, etc., in the states and interfering as to how they are run or um, administered. Now, some of you might say, oh, well, you know, the, lo the Queensland government has such a dreadful um, record in running hospitals, it's better that the feds step in and set standards. Well, uh, as a Liberal, I don't think that's true. I, I actually think that the, the people of Queensland should be saying to their uh, elected representatives, if their hospitals are not good enough, fix them. Um, Small states get over 50% of their revenue from Commonwealth grants. Tasmania gets 61%. Um, even, even my state, uh, Tasmania, got 47% of its total revenue from Commonwealth grants. And so then, well, why don't states raise their own money? And there's no reason for them to do it. The re it's much easier to let the feds raise it, put it all on the feds that they're cutting our programs, aren't they dreadful? you know, not taking responsibility. It is a, a really key problem for our federation that we let this go on. Now, a few weeks ago, the government, federal government raised the idea of states uh, returning to being able to raise their own uh, state income taxes. And that proposal lasted, I think, 48 hours. <laughs> uh, I, I was very disappointed that it both got raised like that and then killed like that because uh, I do think we need to have a really serious conversation about states taking control uh, of their own budgets and that will be partly through income tax and it will be probably partly through the GST um, and they need to be offset by federal government cuts. So if we increase, if we're leaving everything equal and we increase uh, taxes by $100 billion, then we have to cut them out of the federal budget by $100 billion. That brings me to horizontal equalisation. Now that's where COAG gets together and works out of the 100 billion, instead of giving it back to the states in the uh, ratio in which they raised it, they're going to help the poor states, which are South Australia and Tasmania, and uh, they, therefore the others have to pay. And you probably have heard, if you're a w, uh, Western Australian, uh, in recent years, Western Australia has been uh, heavily paying uh, about, uh, you know, out from uh, it, what, not getting back as much as it raises. I would just note, as a Victorian, that uh, Victoria is the only state who has been a net donor every single year, every single year since Federation. Um, WA was a net recipient for 100 years. So um, I'm very, very much in favour of uh, the states getting back uh, what they raise, uh, but I do find WA's campaign on this uh, somewhat, somewhat self-serving. And people say, well, what about Tasmania? What about South Australia? Well, there are ways to fix that. Either the federal government can um, top them up or the people of Tasmania and South Australia could learn to cut their cloth um, you know, to suit their times, because uh, at the moment they are being subsidised very heavily by the rest of us. Um, the other thing about horizontal equalisation that goes to the issue of states paying their own way is the way the formula is created is that if a state decided to raise its own taxes, you know, it, it really jacked up its own taxes, the, form, the formula then penalises that state for doing that. So the formula then says, well, you've put up your taxes, so we will give you less of the GST revenue. 
Thank you. And so there is no incentive at all. In fact, there is, is every incentive for states to rely on the Commonwealth, to blame the Commonwealth, and to co cost shift to the Commonwealth. And if I was to suggest one very technical change, that would be the technical change I would suggest. That states are not um, penalised for putting up their own taxes. Let them face their voters and say, we have chosen to have higher taxes and see what their voters say to that. Whereas at the moment they put them up and then it gets taken away in a different place. So that brings me, the final thing I want to talk about is the tax mix within, uh, within states and uh, that brings me to land tax. Now, I've got to say the previous speaker put up very, very quickly a fantastic slide that goes right to the, uh, the heart of why one would support this. And that was a slide of how efficient all the various taxes were. And right down at the uh, most efficient, sort of best tax line was, um, it's, not this it's not this presentation, it's the other one, um, was uh, council rates and then next to that were land taxes because they're, they're fundamentally the same thing. Now, Adam Smith uh, was a, a fan of, here we go, that's it. So we're, we're talking about, Number two. Um, oh, um, <laughs> Adam Smith described land taxes as nothing could be more reasonable. Milton Friedman said it was the least bad tax. Now, before Sinclair Davidson starts uh, getting ready, I, I'm going to have to concede that uh, there are some prominent opponents to land taxes, apart from himself, of course, uh, and uh, they include uh, von Mises, who dismissed it as socialism, and, uh, <laughs> and Karl Marx, who uh, labelled it as capitalism's last ditch. So the reason that I think we need to think about land tax, apart from its efficiency, is that the, the the opposite to land tax is basically stamp duty. So you either tax people on property when they transact it, or you tax them every year for holding it. Now, at the moment, we pretty much tax them as a, on a, as a transactional basis. Now, stamp duty, because it is transactional, disadvantages people getting into the property market more than others. So that means it disadvantages the young, the poorer and the newly arrived. By contrast, land tax disadvantages older people because they are both already asset rich and often income poor, the richer, and existing wealth holders, so those that are already here. Now, that is a meaningful thing to have a conversation about. I think it is really worth having a conversation about who do we advantage and disadvantage with our tax system. And for those of you who are trying to break into the Sydney or Melbourne property markets in particular, the burden of a stamp duty on top of your very, very high entry price um, is, is clearly a, a, a big impost. Now, land taxes do have some problems and I'm sure Sinclair will, you know, elucidate for quite some time uh, as to what they are. However, all taxes have problems. And I do believe that we need to have a conversation that says, do we have a tax system that makes it harder for young people to own a home? Or do we have a tax system um, that says to immigrants coming to our country, um, it's harder for you while at the same time, and I am a farmer, uh, until very recently I was a farmer, we've just sold the farm, we paid no tax at all on our farm. No tax. Great. Yeah. yeah. I think I should get a pause for that, you know, actually. Uh, however, um, you know, what is the difference between someone who is a farmer and somebody running somebody, some other kind of business? The exemptions for land tax for farmers were created when almost all farmland was owned by family farms. Now a big, big 
part of farmland is owned by corporations, you know, do they get a tax break? You know, you, it was all done on a basis that you know people had quite small family farms. You know, they were worth enough to support a family. That is not what farming looks like now. Even family farms are, you know, they, they're big. So there's a fairness aspect to this, and and that's where I I'm going to, to end. I just would like us to think about when we think about state taxation. You know, we are making choices that, are, that go to fairness or, or, as Tim Wilson would say, justice. And I, I, I do think we need to look towards a more just tax system. Thank you very much. Um, I, I will add uh, one little extra point for anyone who is interested in, in Laffer Curves uh, related to the idea of uh, decreasing tax to the state level. The Laffer maximum uh, worked out for the federal level, as I said before, is 45%. If it was at a state level, the Laffer maximum is about 35%. So that's another good reason for libertarians to want to decentralise tax. It's harder to increase the rates. Um, but anyway, so moving along, um, Michael Potter has a, a wonderful pedigree because he's uh, an ex-Treasury economist who's then a research fellow at the uh, Centre for Independent Studies. And as I understand it, that's the pedigree of all the best economists um, <laughs> standing immediately in front of you. Uh, so <laughs> everyone, please welcome Michael. Hi, and thank you for having me. Uh, so I'm going to talk about this. Well, it's this, yeah, it's this afternoon now. Um, so I'm going to be talking about Australia's tax burden. So I'm going to sort of take a step up from uh, the conversation which we've had so far um, and look particularly at the overall burden of Australia's taxes. Uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is international competitiveness, sort of along the lines of what Andrew was talking about. Then the next one I'm going to talk about is the history of the tax burden. And the third thing I'm going to talk about is the costs of the uh, tax burden. And just a, a small point, the uh, information which I've got in this paper reflects the policy as at the uh, Commonwealth budget, and so of course things could change, particularly as a result of the upcoming election. Uh, now, first of all, um, so you have thought Australia was a low taxing country. If you thought this is because a lot of people say this, lots and lots of people say this, including the federal government. The uh, government of various kinds have repeatedly and frequently said Australia is a low taxing country. Um, is that right? No. Wrong. So, and Andrew has touched on this, but I'll go into this in quite a bit more detail. Now, basically, uh, the IMF actually says that our tax levels are above the developed world average. So, what you've been hearing from the government and from lots and lots of commentators is wrong if you go on IMF data. Why, but why do people say that? It's because the OECD says the opposite. So the IMF data says we're above the average, the OECD data says we're below the average. Um, and so it actually becomes a question of who do you believe out of those two. And the difference between them is something, is, uh, what is called social security contributions. Australia does not have these, so that's maybe why you, you're thinking, what on earth is that? But a lot of OECD countries do have them, and they can be quite a bit of money. Um, so the IMF does not treat these as taxes, but the OECD does. Now, what's that all about? Social security contributions are basically, you go to work, part of your wage gets paid into a very large fund, and then when you retire, some money comes out of the fund to you. Now, normally, when you think of a tax, there is no direct link by the money you put in and what you get out. So you pay your taxes to the government, you get schools and hospitals in return, but there's no direct link. However, however with social security contributions, there very often is a link. It's not a close link, but there is a link. So, for example, if you work for more, you get more money back in retirement. If, sorry, if you work for uh, you know, higher wages or for a longer time in the labour force, you generally get more money back. So there is a bit of a link. And so that's one reason why you may not include these contributions as taxes. And that's what the IMF does. And then what do you do if you actually see the data? This is the data, um, the, the data I downloaded from the IMF website only a week or so ago. Um, and you see, um, oops. Yeah. Um, you can't actually see Australia there, but it's uh, just above the average. Um, it's a bit hard to read it. On, on, my, on my version, the, uh, 
the yes, I'm sorry, the um, Australia should be highlighted there. Um, and the dotted line, that's uh, the uh, unweighted average, and the yellow line is the uh, weighted average. So Australia is above uh, the um, OECD average on this data. But, of course, this is the average for the developed world. What about averages for um, the whole of the globe? And uh, th there's a vast amount of information on this, so I'll only talk a, a bit, little bit about a couple of them. First of all, there's the uh, corporate rates. Uh, now, again, Australia's not showing up, but Australia is, about, is, is one of these ones here, obviously on 30%. So our company rate um, is just above the weighted average and quite a bit above the unweighted average. Um, now, of course, our company rate is set to go down, um, depending upon who wins the election, but the global average is going down as well. Um, so there's no guarantee that we're going to be above the average uh, when, uh, in 10 years' time. Our top marginal rate, however, is much, much further above the uh, global average. So we're 49%, so we're sort of around about here. Uh, we're, we're way up there. And there's uh, the unweighted average and there's the weighted average uh, down there. Sorry, the other way around. This is the unweighted average and that's the weighted average. But on uh, both of them, we're way above. Uh, there, and there are lots of other data, ways to look at the data, but this is uh, just some of them showing that we're internationally uncompetitive. Now, I just might go on to uh, looking at the history of the tax uh, burden. Now, um, I've taken a 40-year average. That's this dotted line here. And where are we right now? We're right there. So we're just above the 40-year average. But look at this. We're set to go way above. And this is the numbers from the budget. This includes the tax cuts in the budget. Uh, which are sort of pretty minimal, if you ask me, but, uh, and they're offset by tax increases, I should also point out. Uh, and what we're going to be doing, ending up here, we're going to be ending up at tax rates, which are about what we had during the mining boom. And if you hadn't noticed, our economy is nowhere near as good, as strong as it was during the mining boom. And yet that's what we're going to end up here in uh, 2021, on, based upon my figures, if nothing is done. And, of course, uh, some people are talking about uh, tax increases. Uh, so this is where we're going to be if, if nothing is done. And some people are saying, oh, no, that tax level is wrong. We want it to be higher. Um, and I did uh, talk about uh, the total tax burden. So it's useful to look at what's happening with the tax burden of all Australian governments. Again, we've got the average in the blue dotted line. And where we are is, um, is right uh, let me just check. Yes, it's th this point here, this, that, that, um, that point there. It's set to dip just a tiny bit and then go up again. Yet, yet again, we're heading towards levels that we saw during the middle of the mining boom. And that's if nothing is done. And my feeling is that most people are talking about, oh, uh, we don't like this tax level. We'd like it to be higher. Thank you very much. I'm basically saying that taxes uh, burden should not be going up. What we've seen in the past should not be happening. Um, if there is a problem, we do have a problem with the deficit, but what should be happening if there is a problem with the deficit? And I say, let's look to history, and I've done a bit of analysis, which I, I won't go through here. I've, um, I've written a post about it on the, on the ABC's The Drum website, and you can look at that if you want to. Look at the history um, of when uh, the budget was close to balance, when the def we either had a small deficit or a small surplus. What was the budget like then? In those periods, when the deficit was small, guess what? Taxes were around about their current levels and spending was much lower. So if history is to be a guide, and you might mount an argument against that, but if history is to be a guide, we should be having taxes not going up and we should have a large cuts to spending. And um, I'll just uh, finish it talking about the, um, the modelling. Um, and you'd probably have to be uh, under a rock to have not heard about this, but there has been quite a bit of modelling done of the impact of tax cuts on the economy. And there's been a lot of work done, particularly by the Treasury, uh, showing that there are very big benefits uh, from tax reductions. And uh, the, uh, an important point which has uh, been raised is the, what's called the self-funding aspect of the tax cuts. This is sort of the counterpoint to the Laffer argument. If you reduce taxes, you will actually get some of it back through higher revenue. 
Um, but it's a, it's a more subtle a argument here. It's because it's not getting, getting the money back directly. What happens is the tax burden goes down, more investment occurs, and so the economy grows bigger, and then the government gets uh, some of that money back. Now, the modelling from Treasury says about half, and um, a leading economist, Chris, uh, Chris Murphy, has done some modelling showing it's about half as well. And so all the costs which we see in the budget um, don't factor that in. But in the long term, it's going to happen. Um, might not be for quite a while, but at least half of the cost is going to come back through higher revenue, which means that the headline cost is actually smaller. Now, conversely to all of this modelling of uh, tax cuts, we've also, uh, Treasury did some modelling, which uh, uh, Scott Morrison released earlier this year, what's the cost of tax increases? And they're really quite substantial. Uh, and uh, they're sort of the converse to each other. Obviously, if there are big benefits of tax cuts, we're going to see substantial costs from tax increases. And I might end by making one more point, which is there's a lot of discussion over the past week or so about the economic benefits of spending increases, particularly education spending increases. Um, I'm not an expert at that modelling, but the modelling uh, which I've seen uh, is vague and unsubstantiated. It uh, sort of vaguely says, if we implement this policy, we will get this outcome and therefore it will generate growth. But each step in that chain has not been uh, shown. In, we have not actually seen direct modelling of the impact of any political party's change in education spending. What, however, we have seen is direct modelling of the exact policies which are being proposed. Um, the tax increases, which we've seen, uh, uh, forecast in the budget, we've seen modelling. We've actually seen modelling of the impact that that will have. And conversely, we've seen direct modelling of the benefits of the spending cut, uh, the um, company tax cuts, which are included in the budget. We have seen modelling of those numbers, whereas on the other side, we have not seen uh, modelling of the benefits to the economy for, of education spending increases, or to pick another example, the uh, decisions to uh, spend huge amounts of money on submarines in Adelaide. Um, I think there's a distinct contrast there of what we've seen. The uh, been very precise about the costs of tax cuts and the benefits of, sorry, the costs of tax increases and the benefits of tax cuts, whereas on the other side, it's all been quite vague. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Michael. The, uh, I think it's probably worthwhile pointing out as well, the, the numbers you had up there for, for all of Australia, that was uh, federal plus state, that didn't include local. Yes, it if you, well then, you're disagreeing very vehemently with Simon Cohen, who is trying to decrease tax down to 30%, and you say it's 27 so, uh, something not right here. Australia's tax is about 34% uh, of GDP. Uh, and the CIS, I mentioned that because the CIS has this uh, Target 30 campaign. So trying to get the size of government down to 30%, which is an admirable enough goal. Uh, I just think it's worthwhile, when you're looking at that, it's worthwhile remembering uh, that the, the, the uh, hardline radical libertarian reformer John Maynard Keynes <laughs> Um, once made the point that uh, government should never grow more than 25% of GDP. Now that would be inappropriate. So uh, at this point in time, if, if so I'm John, that is measured with reference to the expenditure side. Yeah. And then they're that different. And yeah. Anyway, that's not the point. Okay, the point is about the, the point here is about Maynard Keynes. Would you like to talk about Maynard Keynes? Yeah. All right. So um, if John Maynard Keynes. Uh, came here today and uh, looked at the nature of the debate we're having, uh, he would have to conclude that the Centre for Independent Studies is, uh, is far to his left. Uh, so I'm not quite sure what that says about the nature of uh, the, the evolution of the growth of government over the last uh, 100 years. So um, on to our last speaker now. Uh, Catherine is a lecturer of international tax law. So uh, I believe that means she's going to be able to tell us uh, how to hide our money so that we don't have to pay tax. So everyone, please welcome Catherine. Okay, I'll try to keep this reasonably brief so we have, do have time in the end for questions and discussions. Um, and don't worry, by 
the looks of my slide, which at the moment looks very um, unliberty focused, but it's just sort of floating on talking about basically how the media is promoting the whole issue of multinational tax avoidance. We've already had the conversation a bit about, well, what is our tax mix um, and you know, income tax and the government's over-reliance on corporate tax. And partly because of that over-reliance on corporate tax, there is obviously concern if, whether it's companies um, or, you know, at the moment, you know, high wealth individuals not paying what is considered their fair share of tax. But it's always the question, well, what is a fair share? Um, so media very much skews the debate to make it look like these companies are paying you know, hardly any tax at all. This is terrible. You know, we're all paying tax at you know 30 percent or you know 37 percent, and I'll look at all these companies paying tax at you know, just a fraction of a percent of their revenue. But that's the problem. They refer to revenue rather than taxable income. So this was an article um, from the ABC, our friends at the ABC last year, um, saying that you know, almost 600 major corporations did not pay tax in the 2013 to 14 income year. And then they had this graph showing that the top firms, just in terms of revenue, what percentage of their income was paid in tax. Um, and you can see from that that yeah, it looks like if you're if you're not familiar with how the tax system works, if you just see that graph, you would think, oh well, yeah, this is terrible. These companies aren't paying any tax, but it's completely ignoring any expenses they have. So even if you're just a Australian-based non-international company doing absolutely nothing at all to minimise your tax, your tax rate is still going to be a lot less than 30% of your revenue because clearly yeah, every business is going to have expenses. Um, and then further, if you do read a bit more into the figures there, they talk about how some companies had prior year losses, which again doesn't mean they're avoiding tax. It means yeah, they've had losses in the past and can now reclaim them as deductions. So there's a lot of sort of media spin to try to make it you know, look like, oh, well, this is terrible. This is why the government doesn't have enough money to, to fund all, everything they, they need to fund. And similarly, sorry, how do I go forward on that? Oh, I don't know. Oh, okay, um, okay, so this was then uh, actually an uh, earlier article in the Australian Financial Review. I want to just put this one up because it did um, sort of have their tax break section and if you are interested on the AFR webpage, they, you can, can link to all of those, those topics they discuss. But again, when they talk about Google, they're saying, oh, well, yes, they do pay, pay tax, but they pay you know, 5 million tax on 2 billion of revenue. And again, you know, isn't this terrible because it's 0.2% and it's paid in Singapore. So again, they're highlighting the, the percentage of tax as, um, as compared to their revenue rather than their taxable income. But the reason I want to just use this slide is there's just a few points I want to make in regards to some of the issues that um, the AFR has talked about in relation to IKEA and Amazon and um, the other companies up there. Um, and really it comes down to two main issues. The first is where should the profits be taxed? In Because we are a worldwide economy, you know, which country should have taxing rights? So they have just sort of the, um, and their Amazon in the case of the missing 1.7 billion. And that is essentially on the basis that Amazon has customers here, but they're not declaring much income in Australia. Um, so if you look into that article, it talks about that uh, the Australian accounts show they have 1.5 million of revenue in Australia, but senior Australian publishing figures say the real figure for local turnover is around 250 million. So it gives the impression that, well, they're, they're hiding all this money offshore. But the problem is that income tax is one thing and GST and consumption tax is another. So our income tax system has never been based on the idea that your income is generated where your customers are. So if you think of Amazon, you know, they're online. If you, know, you buy a book from, from them, it's delivered to you. What is the company actually doing in Australia? All they're doing is delivering the book to you. There's no real connection to Australia in terms of the income they're generating, apart from the fact that the customer is here. And that's what consumption tax is based on. And depending on what happens with the election, the government has said that starting from 1 July 2017, um, Amazon will have to, and companies similar to them will have to start collecting GST on all the books and everything we buy from overseas, um, which is something I would go off on a very long tangent about because I have a lot of issues with that. But, um, <laughs> but, so that, but from the consumption point of view, that's fine. The customer's here, that's where, if GST is going to be collected, 
sure, yeah, we should pay GST on it. Uh, but in terms of the income tax side of things, Amazon's not really doing anything in this country. But there's the attitude that because the customers are here, oh, well, suddenly they should be declaring all this, this revenue and paying tax on it. Um, so that's the, sort of the first big issue, just, well, where should, where should tax be being paid? Um, then the second one, and I'll just use IKEA as the example here, um, there's the issue about, well, is there artificial profit shifting between companies where you do have you know, subsidiaries in countries that are a lower tax jurisdiction, and as you know, we're aware from this panel, there's quite a lot of countries with lower corporate tax rates than us. So there's the concern that um, your prices are artificially inflated between related parties to lower profits in a country with a higher tax rate, maximise profits in a country with a lower tax rate. So this, I mean, I'm not going to say this isn't an issue because it is. There have been cases. Uh, Chevron's the most recent one, although that's currently going on appeal. Um, but there, there can certainly be a problem with transfer pricing and this artificial profit manipulation. But then you get um, in the IKEA article basically them talking about, well, IKEA's real profits and completely excluding any related party payments whatsoever. So things like franchise fees, any borrowings and, and interest and things like that. So if you think about sort of the franchise fees one, I mean, it would essentially be saying that, oh, well, they shouldn't be paying any franchise fees to their head company and yeah, therefore the IKEA brand isn't really worth anything because that's essentially what they're paying for through the franchise fees and through royalties and everything like that. And I think clearly when you have a company like that, a lot of their value is with that brand. So we need to make the distinction between the idea that um, yeah, there are going to be related party payments and just ensuring that, okay, that they are at a realistic level. Um, and we already have legislation that does that. We have transfer pricing legislation. We have thin capitalisation legislation to limit um, debt deductions if you've borrowed money from subsidiaries or, uh, sorry, just related parties and things like that. So when the budget this year, and I'll just end on this point, talked about bringing in the, the Google tax and there's no legislation on it yet, but I've read the discussion paper, which is still quite brief. A lot of what's in that, in my point of view, that would already be captured by the current laws. So I don't know whether that's just a response to the, the media and public backlash going, oh, this is terrible, none of these co companies are paying tax and the government feels they have to do something about it. But they, in my opinion, they really should just look at, well, what current laws do we have? If they aren't working, why, why is that the case? And maybe it's because the companies aren't actually doing anything thing wrong. Um, and sorry, just the one final point. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, and this was mentioned in Matt's speech last night. Um, you know, companies that are here, they're employing people here, they're paying payroll tax here. Um, there's other taxes apart from income tax. So we shouldn't purely be focusing on, oh, well, what, what is this company doing for, for Australia because they're not paying enough tax, but looking big picture as well and look at what they're contributing in terms of, of jobs, in terms of other taxes, um, and move on from, from there and just ensure that, okay, that companies are complying with the law, but if they are, well, how, how can we ask them to pay any more than what they're legally required and claim that that is their fair share? Okay, thank you. All right, so we do have uh, about 15 minutes for questions, so please uh, think, of, think of one as we go. We have roving mics. Uh, but just quickly, um, uh, I should add that uh, I, I tried to correct uh, Michael on the uh, size of the tax take. Um, I got the tax and spending confused. He was right, I was wrong. Uh, but anyway, um, I, I was wrong once before. It's not the first time. It was a, it was a Tuesday, I think. It's very stressful. Um, no, no, it's actually a bit more complicated. No, it doesn't matter. It's really, it's, it's not the point. It's not the point. I made an anecdote about Keynes. No, that no, was I the point. Uh, question? Um, no, I can, I, can I address it? Um, my figures were about tax only. Uh, the figures that Simon talked about were tax plus non tax revenue, and that's quite a big difference. Quite a big difference. Would anyone yeah. like to answer that? Okay. Does anyone. Sorry, um, right. No, okay, Ilya. Uh, so, my name is Ilya Selman, and uh, I guess the, the question would be to anybody who wants to answer it. Uh, that this is about the land tax issue, that you know, there was some discussion that land tax may be a great way to fund state or local governments, and I hesitate to disagree with great economists like Milton Friedman and others, but there is at least one uh, issue to consider here, which is that land is immobile. That is, you can move from state to state, 
you can't take the land with you. So taxing immobile assets may diminish tax competition between jurisdictions uh, in a way to perhaps taxing income, which I know many libertarians don't like, but taxing income does have uh, a greater possibility to generate competition. But perhaps there's some advantage to land taxes that are missing. So I look forward to your response to the question. Uh, on, your, on your point about land being immobile, that actually is one of the advantages uh, of land tax. The point is that if your land tax rate in one state is too high, you would sell in that state and move to another state. Um, so you, you get com competition via um, movement rather than, uh, you know, the, the fact that the land doesn't move is actually one of its advantages. There are disadvantages to land tax, which is why I, uh, you know, carefully put my remarks to suggest that I know there are disadvantages. And the main one is that the valuation of the land is done by the same body that then taxes the land. And historically, that has meant that uh, if you don't have breaks on that, you end up with too high taxation rates. And that is a serious problem with land tax, and I, I completely accept that. Uh, but we have extraordinarily high levels of STAM at the moment, and there may be a rebalancing that uh, can get us towards a better place. But your particular argument is actually an argument for land tax because you would just sell there and go somewhere else. Well, it, it, it could be either way. It depends on whether you think it's a good or a bad thing to have an inefficient tax, and that's a diff interesting debate in and of itself. We've got a question in the corner. Um, a few years ago, Keith Henry was doing a review of the tax system and doing public meetings all over the place. I went to the Sydney one, where there was a group who was um, pushing a case for um, a transaction tax of approximately 2%, I think, from memory, which would be eliminate all other taxes. Has anyone on the panel got any knowledge or comments on that? Yeah, a uh, terrible idea. <laughs> Next. <laughs> uh, no, it's, um, it, it would be... One of the worst taxes, uh, we, we, which uh, I assume is on Andrew's uh, thing, was uh, um, stamp, stamp duties. Uh, and that's another type of stamp duty. Um, stamp duties are terrible. Um, this would actually be worse. A 2% tax would actually be worse than a stamp duty because it would apply to financial transactions. And it would generally apply, uh, technically, to the total value of the transaction rather than the value added of the transaction, which effectively means you'd have an astronomically high tax rate on assets that are turned up where there's a very small value added. Um, and I'm, not, I'm not an expert at this, but it is an absolutely terrible, terrible idea. I agree. Peter uh, Shepard, my question is principally for Andrew Bragg, but I think Michael might have a view on it. Um, Australia's corporate income tax operates as a withholding tax. Uh, ultimately, the tax, it, 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 it's rebated it against income of resident um, business owners, um, and I think it's dealt with through DTAs and um, transnational uh, uh, taxation agreements from respective uh, foreign owners. Um, where then the absence of reduction in marginal tax rates for business owners, natural people, uh, is there an advantage from reducing the corporate tax rate? Surely it can't be the change in sort of taxation of undistributed profits. In, in, in my role with the Financial Services Council, I've seen an extraordinary amount of uh, decisions made uh, whether or not to domicile a particular function in Australia. Um, and for example, um, you might decide that you're going to set up a, a funds management business where you're going to have someone who's going to decide what stocks to pick, you have a stock picker, and you have someone who actually executes the trades, and then you have people who administer the fund, so people who do the accountancy and do, do, do the legal, which are all different, different components. And time and time again, uh, we see people making a decision not to, to put any of those functions here. They'll put the trading desk in Singapore, they, will, uh, the stock, they might have the stock picker here, but then everything else goes, goes to New Zealand. Um, so, commonly cited as one of the biggest factor is, is, is the corporate tax rate, um, especially comparing it to Singapore and Hong Kong. 
uh, where, where you might actually be, be um, deliberating where you're going to put that put that business. So I think uh, the 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 fintech businesses, which are different to the traditional sort of funds management uh, businesses that I talked about there. I mean, they're not, they're not even going to look, look at us until we get closer to, to 20%. Um, and I think that uh, a lot of them are asking for subsidies as well to set up shop here, which uh, I don't think is a good idea. Uh, so this is, this is, from our um, vantage point at least, the best thing we can do. And one more comment. Um, yeah, that, that's actually a really good question and I think it's an important point. Um, it is true that largely the imputation system means the personal tax rates offset the, the, the corporate rate, which is an argument of course for personal tax cuts. So the impact is largely on foreigners, um, but foreigners are very um, responsive to our tax rate, which is sort of the counterpoint to what, what Andrew is saying. Um, the evidence suggests that is true. Um, and so what happens if we have a lower company rate, tax rate, we'll get more investment into Australia, which will drive our growth. There you go. Yep. The other part of that is taxing uh, reinvested profits. Yeah, um, true. Uh, Schneider. Schneider, uh, for Andrew. Uh, if you had a blank sheet of paper and were going to write uh, how superannuation would be taxed, uh, how would you go about it? A blank sheet of paper. Yeah. We we would have started. Well, we would have a system where you're not taxing um, on the way in. You're um, depending on your other pressures. We may tax something on um, the period in which it's in the fund, and then you would you would you would tax on the uh, sorry then you have tax on the way out. Um, so basically, you reverse what we have. Now the um, the 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 enormous challenges of turning of flipping that around today, uh, I think, are, are so are so great that it would be probably the electoral suicide for anyone to, to look at it. Uh, but now we appear to be in a realm where we're prepared to make rather dramatic changes. Uh, perhaps uh, it is time that we that we looked at that. I think that the biggest challenge for the super system is, um, and super is really about savings, not about tax important point, right? Um, is is it going to work? Uh, and I think the the community, I think, will, will lose confidence in the system over the next five to ten years if it's not seen to be you know, reducing the number of age pensioners uh, either wholly or partly. And I think that um, that unless we're encouraging middle Australia to, to save more, then we're in strife. Um, I think that the constant tinkering and the rule changing is is very likely to be eroding those people's confidence that we need most. Um, I just be interested in getting a quick like grab back of opinions about the prospect of raising uh, the GST to fifteen percent. No. <laughs> I mean, I am answering your question. I'm just. Uh... <laughs> Uh, I may maybe in the sense that I, I don't think I can stand up and say we need to fix vertical fiscal imbalance and not understand what that means for how you change the tax mix. And uh, if I'm advocating for efficient taxes, then uh, the GST is part of that. But um, it needs to be part of a broader conversation and usually in the past when it has been, it has been part of a broader conversation about raising taxes. And, and in that sense, I don't support it. Only if you reduce uh, significantly company tax, but also you need to sustainably reduce uh, personal income taxes by uh, indexing, in, indexing the tax thresholds, otherwise you increase the GSC yep. and you're back in the situation yep. in five years. Um, yep. So yep. It, it, can't be, it can't be an overall tax burden increase, it's got to be part of a tax mix switch, which is sustainable. Uh, yeah, I'd say that um, in theory, yes, in practice, no. Um, I think that it's, uh, well, first of all, it's, it's not going to happen. Uh, a second uh, point that I'd make is that I, I think that it would get all caught up in compensation. You'd have to raise taxes by $15 billion and give $15 billion of compensation and you actually end up with a tax increase of $15 billion. That's, that's just probably what would happen in practice once you got it through the Senate. Uh, and another point, this is going back perhaps more theoretical, uh, there's actually a sounder argument purely from a theoretical position to broaden the base. 
before you do anything to the right. That, that's going back to the theory, um, and of course, the, the more important point is it won't, it won't work in practice, I don't think. A, a, a increase in the GST that does not increase overall tax revenue, don't think it's going to happen. I was actually just, yeah, Michael's last point was what I was going to say, that I prefer that, to, well, if they're going to increase it at all, and hopefully then accompanied by ta other tax cuts, which most likely wouldn't happen, but I would prefer they look at broadening the base yeah. first, rather, and then yeah, leave the rate ten percent for the time being, and then in the future, then look at it. But again, that's not going to happen, because then you, you know, it's, it's all things like food and, and health and education, and yeah, the government's not going to touch, touch them. I think Michael hit it when he said theoretically yes, practically no. Theoretically it's efficient, it's economically efficient. But looking at the political economy of the situation, I suggest if, if we propose, hey, we'll increase the uh, GST and decrease the income tax, I think you'll find people will come back and compromise by accepting half of our deal, <laughs> which isn't going to be good for us. Um, I think we've got one last question uh, over here. Uh, hi, my question is for you, John. Um, I want to criticise your love affair with the latter curve, because I think the aim of libertarians should be to get taxes as low as possible so that there's more cash in the private sector and we shouldn't be encouraging government to collect more revenue. So how do you respond to that objection? Yes, I, I'm glad that uh, you, you were the person that understood that my point was that we should maximise tax. Um, you saw straight through me. No, my, I was making the point that uh, politicians raise as much as they can. So how much is that? And then you look at the Laffer curve. I wasn't saying we should. All right. Um, we have now run out of time for this session.